destroying Rome, natural disasters. The city of Rome faced constant challenges, not least of which were the destructive forces of fires, floods, and earthquakes. Each one of these has left and continues to leave at times an indelible mark on the city of Rome today. And ultimately, we have the people themselves. Who dismantles Rome in the end will be the people that still live here, tearing apart, recycling those great monuments of ancient Rome and reutilizing them, repurposing them in new, innovative ways. Houses, churches, and new monuments. The floods of ancient Rome are very intense. We have many records of them, in particular the Augustan author Livy cites when some of the floods take place, records some of the big ones in the third century BC. They're few and far between, but they are substantial when they happen. And one of many anecdotes is that for the inauguration of the theater of Balbus, there's a flood in the period of Augustus, and people show up to the inauguration of Rome's third theater in boats because the performance of the show must go on. The floods of Rome become more intense with the passing of time, and there are more frequent floods in the period after the Great Roman Empire. There are a number of reasons for this in terms of how the water is exiting out of the delta, the Mediterranean, how many of the areas where the Tiber River is passing through the city are getting more and more clogged with buildings that encroach upon the Tiber River. And of course, the Tiber River becomes fuller and fuller with floating mills, with the grinding of grain. So there's a lot more that's going to be filling up the passageway of the Tiber River itself, usually on an average 100 meters wide. And we have some amazing documentation throughout the city that shows where the levels of the floods were. And it is mind-boggling to see these markers on Via della Ripetta, or by the facade of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva. And these measurements of the flood levels is impressive. And you understand when you see in the papers today the documentation of flooding that hits a city like New Orleans, the amount of debris and the amount of destruction that comes with the flood, and the amount of effort and work you have to go into to ultimately clear out your city. One of the great responses in ancient Roman times is to build the city up and up and up so that the people living in 2nd century AD Rome are looking back at the structures from 100 years before and they're down in the pit or half buried, if not fully buried. This is the response to living next to the Tiber River, which can flood, and in particular the Campus Martius. We recognize it as a grand floodplain. And those floods continue, and people continue to build up in response. And that is why we have so much of the ancient city buried. Another great factor that affected ancient Rome was fires. And of course, we have many dramatic accounts of those destructive fires, in particular, the Great Fire of 64, the Fire of Nero. But why was Rome so prone to fires? Living in crowded conditions, and we know that a lot of the streets were small and narrow and packed with people selling merchandise. The upper floors of many of the apartment buildings being actually constructed in wood so that you can add more and more stories to these at least five or six story apartment buildings led to fires. And there were fire brigades, there were fountains in every district and every vicus, and yet still the fires broke out. Think about people living in straw mattresses, uh, wooden constructions, having little fires, charcoal burning in their homes, knocking over an oil lamp, and poof, there goes the neighborhood. One of the greatest fires of all, of course, is the fire of 64 in the reign of Nero that breaks out near the stables on a very hot August month. No rain, very dry, stables, horses, straw, hay, and you can see how Rome was a tinderbox. And in this case, the ancient sources and the archaeological evidence gives us an idea of the destruction. And in particular, Tacitus' famous passage that notes that three regions entirely burned to the ground, seven were substantially damaged, and only four remained untouched. And what do you do in response? You rebuild. You confront these natural disasters and build again. Earthquakes are another natural disaster that destroys monuments and wreaks havoc in the lives of Romans. We don't have any ancient art that depicts the destruction of Rome, but we do have an all-important series of reliefs that depict destruction from the massive earthquake that hit Pompeii in AD 62. You can see the ground level swaying and buildings and columns toppling over, and you can imagine then how much more the scale of destruction would have been in Rome with its countless temples and porticos. 
The damage from earthquakes is substantial, and we can look famously to the Colosseum and see how one whole side of that monument has toppled down in the 15th century. But other buildings, like the Pantheon, still stand. How is this possible? We have to go down and look beyond the substantial foundations of these ancient monuments. The Campus Martius is on substantial alluvial deposits and debris from previous occupied levels by the Romans. And when we look over at the Colosseum, half of it is on substantial tuff bedrock, and the other half is on alluvial deposits. So those kinds of materials underneath the cement foundations of the Roman monuments means that when there are tremors, these areas are going to be more substantially shaken and challenged by the tremors of the earthquakes. Therefore, we have on one side of the Colosseum, the outer ring toppling down, and the other side still standing today. It's on more secure natural bedrock. When we look at the two columns, the column of Trajan and the column of Marcus Aurelius, we can see here that the drums depicting the victory figure are still aligned. But over to the column of Marcus Aurelius, we see that the two drums depicting the victory figure have actually slightly shifted. The same earthquake that we attributed to destroying the outer ring of the Colosseum quite possibly also destroyed the same side of the Basilica of Accentius. So one side is standing on more secure natural bedrock, but the other side, severely challenged. It's evident when we look at the ancient monuments of Rome that they're piecemeal. They've been reused, they've been torn down, they've been abandoned. And of course, the many sacks of Rome have left their mark on the city. But it's also the unexpected trauma from fires, floods, and earthquakes that have left an indelible mark on the city of Rome that we still see today.